Start it. Okay, okay, go ahead. Okay, so it's a pleasure for me to introduce Ariel Porti today from Laurentian University. And uh, she's going to switch topic and she's going to talk about the agent of Q fever. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Um, so I am conducting my master's thesis project at Laurentian University and I'm co-supervised by Dr. Albrecht schulte hostity who is at Laurentian, as well as Dr. Claire Jardine, who is here at the University of Guelph. And so today I would like to discuss the potential role of wildlife in the transmission of Coxiella bernetti. So Coxiella bernetti is a virulent obligate intracellular gram negative bacteria, which ultimately means that it needs to be inside the cells of host species in order to grow and divide. What is interesting about this bacteria is that in its spore-like form, it remains uh, viable in the environment for many, many years after dissemination. It's classified as a category B agent of bioterrorism, so category A is the worst. And most importantly, it's a zoonotic bacterium, which of course is why we're all here today to talk about zoonoses and public health. So the main source of human infection is by inhaling um, infectious bacterial spores shed from small ruminant species. So in humans, infection is referred to as Q fever. So there's two forms, acute and chronic. Acute Q fever typically leads to symptoms similar to the average everyday flu virus, and quite often the symptoms are self-limiting. Chronic Q fever, on the other hand, is, um, is much more serious, as the name entails, and leads to conditions such as chronic fatigue syndrome and chronic endocarditis. Animal infection is a bit different and is referred to as coxiolosis. So most animals remain asymptomatic when infected with coxiolosis. However, small ruminants usually develop reproductive complications, including weak offspring, stillbirths, and uh, spontaneous abortions. So these animals shed the bacteria in their milk, feces, genital mucus, and in highest concentrations in birthing tissue. The reason we care so much about uh, Q fever and Coxiella bernetti is that there was a recent outbreak in the Netherlands. So in 1984, there was a European milk quota introduced for dairy cattle. So naturally, farmers discontinued farming cattle and began farming uh, small ruminants. So between 2007 and 2010, there were a reported 4,000 acute Q fever cases, and 50% of these cases required the care of hospitalization. There were 250 chronic Q fever cases, and unfortunately there were 14 fatalities. The main control measures for this outbreak were a mandatory animal vaccination program. However, the vaccine was ineffective for pregnant animals. So just under 52,000 pregnant animals were killed as a result, regardless of whether or not they were infected. Okay, so the tail end of the Netherlands outbreak, Dr. Shannon Meadows uh, was conducting her PhD research here at the University of Guelph, and so she was looking at the uh, zero prevalence of Coxiella bernetti among small ruminant farms, so dairy goat and sheep farms. Um, so she was looking at the zero prevalence of the animals as well as the humans that worked on these farms. And so just looking specifically at the, uh, the goat results, she found that 63% of dairy goat farms tested positive. So this means that at least one individual on these 63% of farms tested positive for Coxiella bernetti antibodies. Consequently, she found that 65% of the humans caring for these animals also tested positive. So very, very high significance here in our hometown of our, our homeland of Ontario. Okay, so the same time Shannon was conducting her project, um, there was an undergraduate student at Laurentian University, Mary Thompson, who set out with um, my, my Laurentian supervisor to not necessarily investigate Coxiella, um, but rather look for sexually transmitted diseases among small rodent species in Algonquin Provincial Park. So they collected genital swabs from the species indicated here, um, and they extracted the DNA from the swabs, and then they pyrosequenced the samples. And consequently, they found that six out of seven small rodent species tested positive for Coxiella DNA. So woodland jumping mice on the left-hand side 
exhibited the highest prevalence of coxiella or coxiolosis, um, and eastern chipmunks exhibited zero infection prevalence. So what's really interesting about this, um, this study is that it's in the middle of Algonquin Provincial Park, and I don't know if many of you are familiar with Algonquin, so I've got a map here, and the star indicates the location that the genital swabs were collected. So it's in the middle of a protected park, nowhere near the vicinity of a small ruminant farm. So then these results then led to the question, are, are, are wildlife involved in the transmission of Coxiella burnetti? And in fact, we think, we think they are. So these results then led to the birth of my master's thesis project. And so we hypothesize that wildlife are not only involved in the transmission, but are serving as a reservoir of Coxiella burnetti. So in order for this hypothesis to be true, there are two predictions that need to be accepted. Um, so prediction one, we predict that wildlife will be infected with the same prevalence of coxiolosis on the farms as well as nearby natural areas, so away from the farms. Prediction two, we predict that the bacterial strain type responsible for infecting dairy goats will also be the same strain type responsible for infecting wildlife. So last summer, um, my awesome field crew and I set out and we sampled 16 Ontario dairy goat farms and 14 nearby natural areas. So on each farm, we sampled 30 goats that had most recently kitted. We sampled the other resident farm animals, and we also live trapped the surrounding wildlife on the farm, and then we live trapped the surrounding wildlife in nearby natural areas. So wildlife um, constituted both small and medium-sized mammals, and for every individual, we collected genital and fecal samples, and from the goats, we also collected milk. So I extracted the DNA from just over 2,000 samples. Please don't ask me how long that took to do. Um, so just over 2,000 samples. And then um, I sent them to the Kine Lab at Northern Arizona University, where we tested them for the presence of Coxiella DNA using real-time PCR techniques. So this lab is also where we are applying multi-spacer sequence typing techniques um, to identify the exact bacterial strain type of the DNA found within the samples. Okay, so this, um, this map here indicates all of the sites that we sampled. So farms are indicated by blue circles um, and are representative of goat prevalence. Natural areas are green triangles and are representative of wildlife prevalence, so both small and medium-sized wildlife. And the size of the symbols indicates relative prevalence. So the larger symbols um, are 100% prevalence, and then the smaller symbols, of course, are less than 100% prevalence. And so the main message I want to get across from this map is that there doesn't seem to be a geographic cluster of Coxiella burnetti. It's everywhere in southern Ontario, which, of course, for my project is great, but from a public health perspective, maybe, maybe not so great. So just like looking, uh, looking now at the prevalence of the, the goats on all of the different farms that we sampled, so here I've got the 11 farms that were selected from Shannon's uh, uh, seroprevalence study. So these farms uh, were seropositive in Shannon's study. So um, in 2010, they were seropositive. So we expected that in my study, they would also test positive. And that's what we found. Um, so farm 15 is maybe, um, has a little bit less prevalence than the other farms, but as you can see, they're all, um, they all have quite high prevalence of coxulosis. What we didn't expect was that our seronegative farms would also be positive. Um, and not only that, but again, at quite high prevalence. So we essentially don't have any control farms, but that's okay, um, because we're most interested in the story of the wildlife. So what's happening with the wildlife? So just switching gears, um, I'd like to revisit prediction one. So in order for our hy hypothesis to be accepted, we predict that prevalence, um, that uh, wildlife will be in infected with the same prevalence of coxiolosis on the farms as they are in the nearby natural areas. And that's essentially what we find. So the whiskers on all of my figures represent 95% confidence intervals and um, species or groups with the same letter beside the whiskers indicate that they're not significantly different. So here, 
you can see the, the middle um, goats at the top there are exhibiting significantly higher infection prevalence compared to both wildlife on the farm and the natural areas. But what's really important to note is that there's no significant difference of infection prevalence from the wildlife on the farm and the natural areas, which essentially supports our first prediction. So we'll look further um, at the different species of wildlife. So as you can see here, Eastern chipmunks are not only exhibiting the highest prevalence of Coxiella infection, Coxiellosis, they're exhibiting significantly higher prevalence than both house mice and raccoons. So um, this is inconsistent with, with the Algonquin findings in that there were no Eastern chipmunks to be found infected, where, whereas with our study, we're finding that Eastern chipmunks are um, exhibiting the highest prevalence. So as cute as they are, maybe, maybe steer clear of those little guys. Okay, so now looking at the individual species, the difference in sites for, for these species. So deer mice are the only species that are exhibiting a slightly significant difference between um, infection on the farm compared to the natural areas. So farms are indicated by red boxes and natural areas by blue boxes. So deer mice are exhibiting slightly higher prevalence of coxiellosis on the farms compared to the natural areas. Eastern chipmunks, unfortunately we didn't sample any individuals on the farm. Um, for house mice, we unfortunately didn't sample any individuals on the natural areas, so we weren't able to test any differences between these species. However, what's really exciting is that raccoons and red squirrels seem to have no difference in prevalence, no significant difference in prevalence anyhow, which again supports our first prediction. So we just wanted to present um, the results of the other resident farm animals that we sampled. We're not really looking um, at, uh, at testing significant differences here, but um, I think what's really interesting is that all of the species tested, aside from chickens, um, but all of the species tested um, exhibited quite high prevalence of coxiellosis. So chickens, um, we only sampled four individuals, so that's maybe a factor of why we didn't find any coxiellosis in, in these guys. But for everybody else, um, there's quite high prevalence. So lots of infection going on there. So just to conclude, um, we found a lot of support for our first prediction in that wildlife are seemingly just as likely to be infected on the natural areas as they are on the farms, which, um, which essentially means that they are able to actively maintain the bacterial population. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the MST, the multispacer sequence typing results for um, to help investigate prediction two, but I think once those results do come in, it's gonna make for a really awesome story, so please stay tuned for those results. And just to finish up, we're hoping that um, our results will allow us to better understand the transmission dynamics of Coxiella Bernetti. Um, and ultimately, we're hoping that with our results, we'll be able to make better recommendations um, for farm biosecurity to not only help preserve animal, but human health as well. So I'd like to just take one last minute to thank all of the individuals listed here for all of their help and support and guidance along the way. And of course, our funding agencies for financially supporting um, our project. And then you folks for, for taking the time out of your busy schedules to attend this talk. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, so, so the, did everybody hear the question? Are they, okay, so, um, so the question is, um, why did we expect to find that wildlife would be infected with the same prevalence on the farms compared to the natural areas? Because essentially goats shed the bacteria in large amounts um, during abortion events specifically. And so with that, I think, um, so we're, we're investigating the role of wildlife as a potential reservoir. And so if they're not 
able to actively maintain the bacterial population outside of the farms where they're assumingly exposed to much more um, environmental bacteria, then they would likely have lower prevalence in the natural areas where they're not exposed to any, um, any goats or abortion events, hypothetically speaking. So we selected, um, or I selected uh, natural areas that were, what I tried to do anyways was select them so that they were in the same district or municipality of the farms, but far enough away so that there wouldn't be overlapping home ranges for wildlife species, if that makes sense. Does that answer your question? Maybe we could discuss after. Okay. <laughs> Maybe a last question. Sure. Could you comment, I, I believe you noted that you use genital and fecal swabs to detect coxiella. Could you talk about the sensitivity you know, of that tech? I mean, I, I know nothing about genital carriage of goats or any other species of coxiella. I mean, how much could there be under detection of uh, infection through uh, versus, say, serology or something like that? Right, exactly. So we were testing for the presence of the DNA. Um, so we, from each individual, we collected two genital swabs. So I combined those swabs to help with the sensitivity. And then fecal samples, we collected uh, fecal material. And if no fecal material was available, then we collected um, swabs. And so the, um, the Kine Lab at Northern Arizona University are experts when it comes to Coxiella. And they've identified 36 different strains of the bacteria. And so um, when detecting for presence absence, we, we looked for the IS-1111 gene. Um, and so we, we considered a sample positive if the critical threshold was below 35. So if it, if it took more than 35 cycles for it to amplify, then we considered it negative. Yes, okay. Thank you. Awesome, thank you Thanks. so much.